For those of you who don't know Jacob, he is um, currently the Senior Manager for Risk Monitoring and Evaluation <coughs> at the Mining Qualifications Authority, but he certainly holds a very colourful past, having um, worked as a, a Chartered Accountant and also at local various local municipalities. He was the Head of Internal Audits, which I don't think many of us would necessarily want that position, but he's also acted as the Chief Risk Officer for almost two years now and has uh, provided combined assurance on enterprise risk management, monitoring and evaluation. And with over more than 18 years experience in governance, risk and compliance, it's, it's certainly un understandable why his topic is what it is, which is monitoring and evaluation as a governance tool to enhance accountability and service delivery. And just as, as Ben has said, to just remind you that we've now selected, we've selected candidates that are sort of in the midst of their journey, not so far along. So Jacob can tell us where he is, but just to bear that in mind, because some of his questions that he'd like us to consider are actually related to where he is in his study. So we felt that when students are very far along in the journey, we don't often get to probe what we want to probe and um, because someone's already basically done. So now we're trying to look at students who are much earlier in the journey so that we can really have a mindful engagement, um, Ben, should I call it an aggressive engagement, about, <laughs> about, the, about the topic and also to assist the students on their journey because part of this is about that engagement with other intellectuals and stimulating your own intellect. So I hand over to you. And before he starts, I want to pose for the questions that he asked, yeah. and I'm going to uh, aggressively indicate specific colleagues. <laughs> no, that is terrible. So, terrible. <laughs> he wants an answer from you whether the research methodology that he chose is applicable. So you can ponder on that one. Let me go. Okay, he also asked, he said, if you listen to him in his discussion, do you think the topic the problem statement and the research design <coughs> will assist him to get the best research output. So is the methodology, the tools that he's going to use relevant, and is the broad design going to get him to where he wants if you listen to his topic and his statement and his design? Let me go further down. <coughs> Can we get the guy on the tell cell phone? <laughs> yes. Marcus. Bru Marcus. The problem statement, he says, is around misuse of state funds, poor governance and accountability. State funds, poor governance, accountability. What kind of questions do you think can he ask the research participants without scaring them to open up and share the real problems? <coughs> so there's a problem of misuse of funds, poor governance and accountability. If you can come up at the end of this afternoon to say, well, maybe you can ask one or two, three questions which would not scare people to open up. Okay, misuse of funds. Poor governance and accountability. And accountability. Yeah. Okay. We'll repeat the questions as well. Yeah. We'll repeat them again. Maria, what are the best methods of implementing skills development and do you have any suggestions on countries that's done this well? That's the question that he would like. Other, you, any one of we can ask, Shirley can probably answer best on that one, but at least let's just get some debate going on whilst he's talking. Welcome. Jacob. <laughs> thanks very much, Prof. Uh, thanks very much, Ariana, for this opportunity. When uh, Jimmy called me and said, Jacob, you're going to be on Curiositas, I immediately panicked because it's not easy being around the uh, curious individuals. You know what they say, curiosity killed a cat. If we were cats, we we're not going to make it at the end of the day. <laughs> so, <laughs> so basically, Prof, um, I chose this topic really. If you see in South Africa today, the news feed, uh, when you Google, when you tune on TV, you will hear the word corruption and stuff like that. And this corruption in this context, they are talking about government-related um, kind of corruption. So I'm, I'm one of the people that do a monitoring and evaluation on various projects that are implemented by, project, by government. And, uh, and part of my task really is forensic investigation and risk management. So you get exposed to a whole lot of cases that really um, uh, just buckle your minds that to say, really, can people do this? Is this happening? So the topic, my topic is monitoring and evaluation as a governance tool to enhance accountability. 
and the service delivery within the CETA environment. The CETA, I will, I will indicate what is the CETA and then how are they formulated and the board composition of it. So the problem um, um, statement that I really want to um, investigate further and to determine the cause is that billions of um, levy paying employers are invested in the skills development and then, but uh, it seems like when they get into the cities, they are managed by people who lack uh, technical expertise, they don't have the desire for good management, or they have got eagerness to engage in corrupt practices, but to mention but few. So South Africa today um, is one of the countries that really we uh, invest millions of friends in, in skills development. Um, and uh, this really is well captured in the National um, um, this, um, Department of Higher Education, their annual plan, I mean, report indicates um, what is the primary objective of this. And then when you check this skills development, the primary objective according to the N NSDS 3, or the National Skills Development Strategy, which is a policy draft of, of the NDP, is that uh, they want to um, increase growth, economic growth, reduce poverty and unemployment, especially amongst the youth. So today when I was coming here, I heard that the um, unemployment um, uh, rate has increased from 27%. Um, it was 27% from the previous quarter. Now today when they announced, it is sitting at 29%. And this is very sad really when you check the billions of friends that are being invested in skills development and then in job creation projects. So um, the CITAS, the, this money which is um, um, being in, invested through the CITAS, last year the, the budget was around 17 billion uh, that is allocated to the CITAS just to deal with this. So this ambitious plan really to improve growth, economic um, um, growth, reduction of unemployment, uh, poverty, is being undermined by the prevalence of fraud and corruption in government and in the uh, state and uh, old entities, and including in the private sector. So uh, the minister last, year, uh, last, of last week in his budget vote, uh, Praveen, he indicated that there are 3,000 different forensic investigations that have been conducted on fraud and corruption matters that has, has, has happened in the country. And uh, they've identified areas where they can collect this money, which is to the tune of six million rand, uh, where they've identified individuals through these forensic investigations uh, to say we can um, collect this money from uh, these individuals. So when you check last year when I was putting together this topic, the newspaper articles that we have seen in most cases that informed this topic really is um, the corruption, corruption, CETA, uh, corruption, CETA corruption claims mushrooms, and the, the CETA corruption hit jobless amongst, uh, amongst uh, jobless youth, amongst others. So, Bartley uh, 2012 posited that poor image that is being painted by this corruption in the system can be attributed to poor governance, employer empathy, uh, this juncture between the CETA strategy and the employer thus making the authority to be the worst criticized entity after the democratic uh, South Africa, I mean post-democratic South Africa. And this is really um, what this topic seek to really probe further, uh, that, that what is corruption? Um, due to 2006, uh, defined corruption as corruption erodes fair, fair play causing malfunction of systems of government and a loss of institutional con confidence amongst the general public. And then where now it is, 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 is quoted in, um, in, lead, um, in session 2005 by Lee uh, in 2013, she defined corruption as misuse of public office for individual gains. So basically what, what we see here, and, and, and if I may quote the Auditor General as well, um, which they issued a report just um, recently in 2019, um, the Auditor General indicates that we have got irregular expenditure. Irregular expenditure is this expenditure that individuals do not benefit from. It's the money that is spent in vain. 
So the Auditor General indicates that there is a regular expenditure of uh, 25.7 billion rand, and it moved from 29.7 um, to 25.2 billion rand in this financial year. And then he attributes this to lack of accountability, payment to projects that are not supervised or that are badly managed, or projects that are completed. They pay money for projects that never existed. Basically, this is happening due to a lack of monitoring and evaluation. So the other thing that we have uh, picked up through literature is that the there's National Skills Fund, uh, the annual report of 2018-2019, indicates that we have lost as well uh, 1.6 billion rand on artisan development alone. To develop an artisan in South Africa, you need 165 per annum for one artisan. So basically now when we lose 1.6 billion, uh, uh, on one, in one financial year. It, it means that we have lost, missed an opportunity to train 9,091 learners that have completed N2 <coughs> at, the t at, at the TVET or, or, or those ones who have been sitting at home without an opportunity. So, Prof, uh, I have quoted as well um, Malambe uh, in 2000 suggested that the solution to this, it can be perceived uh, to, to this misuse of funds, and, and which is monitor is at mandatory grants. The DHET published a new regulations uh, regarding monies which uh, which they receive as well as the surplus, and that they have to allocate at least only 10.7, I'm um, 10.5, to the total levies paid to administration costs, not more than that so that the money that is collected for skills development can be used exactly for that, skills development. So Nelson, um, 2016, um, page one, suggests that in attempt by government to sustain development through good governance, uh, the public sector monitoring and evaluation system is considered to be the key. So what this tells us is that a lot of money are being spent, but there's nobody who's monitoring the projects that ma this money is spent on, and that there is nobody who's checking whether the project uh, is aligned, the manner in which it's aligned, the, it's being implemented, the objective um, is being adhered to, or is going to achieve the desired result at the end of the day. So I've spoken about the CETA, that this um, study revolves around the CETA. What is the CETA? It's a sector education and training and, and, and authority which was established um, in terms of Section uh, 9 of the Skills Development Act. Initially, these uh, CETA were, were housed under Department of Labor before 2000. So after 2000, the, the CETAs were now, after the establishment of Department of Higher Education and Training, then it was transferred to the Department of Labor to this particular department. And then we had, according to the reports in, by the, uh, the Department of Labor, we had something like 25 sitters. Now some of the sitters were merged, and then now we have got at least 21 sitters. And it cater for all the sectors, your MMS, the mining and the mineral sector, your education sitter, your security sitter, your wholesale and retail, all the sectors are being catered for. So this, the Skills Development Act also indicate how the board should be composed within these sitters so that they can take care of the matters around governance, to enhance accountability and so forth. So the challenge now that we have is that this, the, the, the act dictates that the board should be composed of um, employers, trade unions. You know, trade unions um, are, are, are people who have got a different approach uh, half the time on issues. Government and then interested professionals. Uh, this is according to stay in 2000, um, 2004. I think just in terms of time, because I want your questions okay, to be so answered, if we can speak to the problem statement, if we can just reiterate it so that people know what your specifics oh, yes, are, yes, and sure. the design that you're selecting to solve the problem, then they can maybe probe some questions for you so that we can get onto this sort of thing as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, but he, she, she also indicated that the associated risk with this board composition is that 
Um, normally it is undermined by political patronage because it's the, by the appointing minister, because it's the minister who must appoint this board. And the nominated constituencies is very high, and especially trade unions and the government department. This is according to uh, Buckley and Scott and Shuttleworth. So, ma'am, I don't know how to, because you I don't want to talk the whole problem so. statement, I think, so that people can know it specifically and then just based on that, what design you're going to do to solve this yes. problem. Based on that background that I've just given, um, the problem statement that I've put for this is that um, billions of rents from levy paying employers are being invested in skills development and are managed by the staff that seem to lack technical expertise, the desire for good governance, and that they have got an eager, uh, or they demonstrate eagerness to commit um, uh, corruption in, in this. Basically, I don't know how to put it, Prof. So okay, but that's how you put it now. <laughs> I don't know what is the, and that is the, uh, uh, I think is I don't know if it is a difficult question, but I need my colleagues here who are very curious. Maybe they can they they can assist me in rewording it, and so that I will be able to. Prove I would say that that is the problem. That's the movie in your head. Yes. You will finalize it and get it better later. On, but that's okay. I think we all get a sense what it is. Yes. What is as Mala said? What is the design and the methodology that you? So, so maybe we first ask, this? what yeah. is the aim that you want to achieve with this? So you know your problem. Where do you want to end? Basically, the aim of this study really is to develop a framework, a yeah. monitoring and evaluation framework that can be adopted in the cities. Uh, because currently there is no uh, a framework that guides on how to monitor this project in terms of project implementation and to monitor this project in terms of the expenditure that has been incurred. And you so, sure that that is an aim that has not been covered yet? I've not seen it, Prof. All right, anyway, that's fine. I've, I've, that's your aim. Um, yes. And do you have some specific objectives that you want to achieve towards that aim? Yeah. Actually, if I may add, Prof, the department now has robbed uh, Prof. Mark uh, of of Rhodes University to do the same thing. And then I was privileged to interact with him as an MNE manager in our department, okay. really to feed in some of the. Things that is looking the existing at, and together with uh, my colleague here, Francis. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I know there is no standard framework okay. that has been developed. And you already build a network as it should at this level of research with other knowledgeable people yes. who can add to your repository of understanding. Yes. Okay. And what what are some of the steps, the the interim objectives you want to achieve towards that aim? Prof, um, uh, let me start by the the, the, the research design, and then okay. I will take you through the. Um, I've chosen a qualitative reason being really it, it will allow me to probe issues uh, where I will interview people, uh, talk one on one with individuals in a formal environment where I will sit with them. And then this design also it will allow me to collect data, the secondary data from other reports, the annual reports through observation because now currently I'm a senior manager dealing with monitoring and evaluation. And uh, this research design really allows me to actually do exactly that, that I can probe um, through interviews where I will set up um, interview questions, sit with somebody and probe um, what I'm trying to achieve through this to get to a point where I will determine if they understand exactly what is needed to implement MNE. And who are they? When we speak about they, who would you, because obviously to get in depth, analysis and to probe you want people that have rich data that they'd be able to um, give to you? Uh, in my sample I've selected four different sitters. Two have responded positively because I've sent my research proposal and then I'm still waiting for um, a response from other sitters where now I will interview board members, executive managers, certain senior managers, Specialist, we have got uh, what we call specialists in the city environment. I can interview the administrators as well, just to understand how they are implementing MNE and whether they understand the objective of this MNE. Which talks to this problem statement that we have got billions of rent that have been spent. If you can see, money has been pumped into the cities, but at the end of the day, we don't see. Okay, so, it's quali so you take a qualitative methodology. Have you already identified any specific qualitative tools that you're going to use to do this? 
Um, Prof, um, since I'm still at a very infant stage, um, I'm still working towards, uh, towards that. Um, and, and the questions that I'm asked, I asked my colleagues is to also identify the most suitable tool for me to gather as much data, but which is very relevant. I don't want to gather data, but to find that it does not really address the objective of this study. But I do hear you speak about in interviews, yeah. Yeah. and I do hear you talk about questionnaires. Yeah. So there's already a hint toward those tools. Yeah. But you haven't necessarily def defined the qualitative methodology, the mode of inquiry, which you will apply in using that questionnaire and that interview, like grounded theory or phenomenology. You haven't yet looked at that. Well, I looked at the grounded theory, and then when I checked um, my, how I was structuring this, uh, this study, Graded theory really what it it, 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 it it gives you opportunity to to do exactly what I was talking about that you interview people it's not limited it's not it's not like other methodologies where um, approaches where it's limited to interviews or survey okay. so this one really it gives you an opportunity to interview people to use your observation as well as the data collection uh, tool to use the secondary data uh, that you can um, check from the Auditor General reports, annual reports, certain confidential memos that are issued um, and, and stuff like that so that I can get to the bottom of the problem that we are experiencing okay. in the so, uh, oh, so I think we get a broad perspective where he is. He's yeah. got an end goal in mind, although it's still vague, he knows what's the current problem, he's got some tools that he wants to use and some methodological aspects that have been addressed already. Are there any questions to him at this stage? Shirley? Corruption that's wide and deep and in, in this CETA uh, system, etc., etc. But then it seems, if, unless I didn't hear you correctly, that you're looking at the monitoring and evaluation of the staff that work in the CETA because they might not be able to project manage sufficiently, they're open to corruption, etc. Or did I hear you incorrectly? I couldn't hear too well from you. Oh, okay. So I'm just trying to clarify um, if you're looking yeah. at the mm -hmm. CETA, and you're looking at the potential for corruption and therefore monitoring and evaluation as a tool to harness that and to, to stop all of that. That's one thing. If you're looking at monitoring and evaluation of the staff who work in the CETA and their propensity to not understand what they're doing, to not know what they're doing, not understand project and be open to, to corruption. To me, those are different things. I just want to Because then it almost doesn't matter whether he does it in the CETA or in the bank yes. or on a farm. It's yeah. a thing. So, mm -hmm. that's important. Yes. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, but what I was, I was having in mind is um, really interviewing people who are currently implementing the MNE. That is the manner in which they are implementing it or their monitoring project. I think just say what that is for people who aren't familiar with the space, MNE. Or the monitoring and evaluation. Yeah. The people who are, mo are implementing the monitoring and evaluation, they might be doing it in such a way that it does not get the desired results. They are monitoring project, but they don't ask deep questions. Uh, when you monitor a project, uh, you, one, you have to identify the project that you're monitoring. You must have specific objectives. So what we have, I have observed uh, from where I am, is that we, we were monitoring projects without really checking the objective of this project. What is it that you want to achieve? Okay, but then I want to go yeah. back to Dr. Lloyd's comment. Yeah. Mm. So you can then almost have a comparative study and say, yeah. I'm interested in monitoring and evaluation. I'm going to go to the CETA environment, mm. I'm going to go to three banks, and I'm going to go to the artistic world. And I'm going to get a comparative study of how monitoring and evaluation are conducted by staff accountable for that. So what makes it, why don't you just do that if it is what you're saying you're going to do? No, obviously I did not think it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, John Ray, we do record, so you'll get a recording, so okay. you won't have to yes. take notes so you can focus on it. No, thanks for that, because I was actually <laughs> frustrated that this is going to be only on the seaters, yes. And then some of them, they are not, they are not cooperating very well. So. <laughs> You may do that quickly if they're still there. So <laughs> thanks, Shirley, for bringing that perspective. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Why that I think is very important. Because if you're looking at the staff and their cognitive understanding of the projects, etc., and they're not able to 
in spirit in reading the NSDS3 report, which shows that 67 billion rand went through the CETA system, and the return on investment on internships was 7%, and on learnerships, 13%. Now, is that due to corruption, ignorance, people who don't know how to, wrong staff, etc.? So it impacts very much in the what monitoring and evaluation and could monitoring and evaluation have contribute. stopped and contributed mm -hmm. to make sure that there was a better return on investment. So for me, that clarity mm -hmm. around what you yeah. wanted to look at. Yeah, I think that's... Sorry, so you must either focus it no, not at in all. terms of skills development yeah. or you must say you want to do a comparative thing about monitoring and evaluation. But they don't need to relate to each other. So you're almost at a crossroads. It's no longer about skills development, yeah. given what... <laughs> <laughs> Rocco. Okay. Um, what I'm looking at at the moment, uh, there are a few issues here. Firstly, the one issue is you need to look at the cause of the problem. Don't look at the symptom. There's a symptom will give you a lot of different things. You need to look at the cause. Secondly, look at the strategy of the organization. Where do they want to go and why? Are they creating that strategy? Yes, they want to increase here, they want to increase. But what is the underlying definition of what they want to achieve? Because at times when, when they sit in that position, normally they create a strategy that will fill their pockets for some of them. And, and they actually go over the people that are actually working at it. So they are bamboozled to such a point that they say, oh, this will work, you know, we can, <coughs> and then they come in and say, you will do it this way, you will do it that way, and that way. And that's what I'm saying, look at the cause, not at the symptom. Mm -hmm. If you go back to the cause, you will find the ulterior motive that they have in getting something done. But you need to take your strategy. What are, what are the opportunities of the strategy? When I'm saying opportunity, I'm saying the risk. The risk is not risk, it's opportunity. So look at the opportunities of what that's going to bring. Mm -hmm. So what I like about what Rocco is saying is almost opening it up for you and says systemically look at the bigger picture. What is this? Because even from questioning, you ask what questions can be asked. He's giving you, a, a pointing you to a question. What questions can you ask to open up the understanding of what is the strategy of this entity within which you want to look at monitoring and evaluation? Thanks, Robert, Rocco. Sir. We'll go here. Yes, uh, Robert. It's almost impossible to solve the problem of corruption without increasing the moral uh, standards of people, their moral responsibility, their, 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 their way of looking at life. And in my view, the most likely way of, uh, of doing that is when people move closer to God. I think when you move closer to God, obviously improves your moral standards. So I think that's something that you should really look at, that no matter how many regulations or how many systems you have in place, it is down to the individual who will make that decision about corruption. So that's an interesting perspective. As a researcher, I want to just help you. So Joshua is an atheist. So it will be interesting to know... You can still use, you can still it use will, God. So, it? so it's interesting <laughs> how you will use that barometer. But I think, so he's got a very specific view on morality and how that could play in this. And you must decide how you want to entertain that or deal with that? I will definitely think about it, but the spiritual element of it really I have not explored. Right? Because issues of spirituality normally, they are very complex in nature. But now I will, I will definitely but see he, how he, I will... He yes, opens that door to you, too. Yes, Trisha? then I will, I, will, I will check it. Okay. Okay. Maybe you want to make an <laughs> <laughs> I think my suggestion is just check how much are we not the architects of our own minds. Because with, with, with skills development set up the way it is legislatively, we have to spend money on it being a business. Right? So what does that force us to do? It forces us to tick a box. Right? Not really fit for purpose learning, but tick a box. So with all the youth being unemployed, are we just ticking the box to get the learning on our scorecard? And because it's legislated and because we have to spend that money, or do we need to fit a purpose? Right, so in that aspect, maybe we, maybe there's not that much corruption in there. It's just the wrong things we do. Uh, but because we have to, we are forced to spend the money. We have to do that many learnerships. We engage in the lower levels rather than fit for purpose. And that we could be the architects of our own demise that way. Mm -hmm. Just thought. That's quite a complex matter. Yeah. But I think that's an interesting window. Uh, yes, and then there is some Andres. Well, I could just sort of get a little bit back to uh, the, uh, the 
you know, Ty, the data that you collect, that your data is actually the crux of your whole uh, dissertation thesis, whatever. And the credibility <coughs> of it, it depends on the validity of the data. You actually uh, mentioned you're going to interview four different uh, seaters. Now, listening to everybody here, the, the problem is very complex. It's actually extremely complex because there's so many different dynamics that can play, play a role here. And when it comes to uh, collecting your data, you actually uh, go on until you reach a point where you reach saturation. And uh, so I, I cannot see that, for instance, if you say, okay, four, that you're going to reach saturation and you're going to have credible data at the end of the day. So you actually, when it comes to your sample size, I think that's going to be a fairly complex uh, formula that you have to apply there as well. Can I just get some perspective there from some <coughs> of our alumni, Shirley? Do you just want to reflect a bit on that, the whole notion of quality research, quality research, not necessarily going into a survey and having thousands of people, but maybe have a small group of 30? Do you just want to maybe well, just counterbalance that argument a bit? Also, just some view? A lot will determine, again, on the scope of what you want to look at and your understanding of monitoring and evaluation. And the re once you've got your research problem correctly stated, because out of a correct sample needn't be huge and it needn't be thousands of people. Out of a well-selected sample of, say, 10 people, 20 mm -hmm. people, um, all your 21 seaters monitoring and evaluation senior managers, for example, if you stick into the seater world, what do they understand monitoring and evaluation to be? What have they seen? What have they found? Have they intervened, et cetera? So you can actually... So the richness of the question. The richness of the question and also how you construct your questionnaire, if you're going to use it, um, whether you are going to allow a section for open-ended responses mm. at the end, or, or how are you going to draw that from them. I would also suggest that uh, to, to have a smaller sample, rich, good questions, but then um, supported by a very well-researched uh, literature, mm. literature review, and a, a, and a funny thing to throw in here, but it is in the MNP frameworks, in the, both in the presidency and in the Department of Higher Education, is that they actually look at m and &E, they start off with a log frame stroke um, theory of change approach, which starts identifying what the elements are that you want to monitor and evaluate. So you don't need to have thousands and you know, all of that. I would counter that and say a, a, a rather a sample that is well selected uh, and the richness of your questions and how you engage with it. So that's or, deliberate to confuse yeah. you because there's two views yeah. and you must make a decision. And and I in, support, in support of that as well is in, in qualitative research and Janet and Heather also want to comment, they're both qualitative researchers as well as am I. So trustworthiness, they don't speak to reliability and validity in quantita qualitative studies for a reason, it speaks to trustworthiness. And part of that is about the fact that what your challenge will be in these kind of questions, because one of your questions was linked to how you would get people to do this, is one of the reasons we do in-depth, semi-structured interviews or those type of, of methodologies is so that you can build a trust relationship with someone that they would disclose this kind of information that Dr. Lloyd speaks of to get the rich data. So your justification in terms of the sample size can also be around the fact that you have to ensure that the people trust you to get the type of information you need. And the secondary point, because I want to give other people um, time as well, is around the framework. When you create a model, and some people might um, negotiate or debate this, you do. there's a lot, a lot more around testability <coughs> around that. A framework can actually be a guide or a way to give in-depth understanding to a specific point. And so you wouldn't necessarily need the thousands to actually uh -huh. test it. So I don't know if... Um, okay, there's a question, yeah, and then, and then they're going to need there, two, and then I want the four people to ask their questions. Yeah, and we only the lady have there, minutes. We've got a few <laughs> minutes left. Yeah, uh, I'm an independent researcher, so I've been consulting, and I've done quite a few studies of CETAS since 10 years. in charge of the program not being excited about what they're doing. I don't know how you measure or, or link that to performance management and mm. m and &E, 
but you often find people are very well paid, who drive very big cars, and have yeah. all the projects, <laughs> but really have no interest in the job that they are doing. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's just for me something I picked up, which seems to be so it's, almost, so it's almost understanding the why they do what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Heather? I was say something like, think about what are the personality traits that are needed for a person to excel in that kind of mm. people-facing job that is about capacity development and skills training. So maybe my question about that, to monitor how are they yeah. monitoring or evaluating or assessing the kind of personality traits required mm. For the person to, to do well in that kind of work that is people facing and about empowering the person. Thanks for that's valuable. I like that. Heather? So uh, just want to come back to the debate about corruption and whether the university got is, is, is a, a tool to enhance that. I didn't understand this as a theological study or as a philosophical <coughs> study or from an issue of morality. Because your title here is about accountability and service to them. Monitoring and evaluation <coughs> assumes an external structure and an external extrinsic motivation. Whereas if transformation is intrinsically motivated, your entire study is full. Mm. So the first step might be to say that monitoring and evaluation as an extrinsic study has a positive impact and literature would help you with that. From that, how does an external structure ensure accountability mm. or motivate behavior? Or facilitate that accountability. Yes. And I think it could just be a job, in which case we design smart <coughs> and, and Trish and I, I love that point because I do think the economists have an entire field where they talk about unintended consequences of legislation and, and decision making and how we structure things. So, so even, for example, the design of a form where you force somebody to, to tick a box between male and female mm. positions people to respond in a certain way. So, so, so the, the fact that structure shapes agency is an important point. But your study is positioned that an external structure will extrinsically motivate accountability and service delivery. And you may need to first show that that's valid because it reveals a lot about your epistemology and your ontology. Now she's really going deep. Yeah, no, this is very deep. <laughs> so I want to hope, uh, can I ask Heather, I hope you can continue this discussion. Because I think this can be quite valuable. Heather is our dean of teaching and learning. So, you can <laughs> so you've got proper access to her as a student. Yeah, she's welcome to be very well at the dean's Feel free to, to set up an appointment later. But okay. Your assumptions, and I think this is a, an important point for doctoral students, we all walk into a study with a pre-existing yes. set of assumptions. And it is only in a forum like this that we discover, wait a minute, there's another whole paradigm. What if corruption is all about what's going on inside instead mm. of what's outside? Then nothing I do outside will change. Mm. And, and then, yes, there's a whole other conversation we need to have. But even if we prove that monitoring and evaluation improves service delivery, that would be an enormous contribution. Because then we'd know to invest in that. Mm. If it has no impact on service delivery, well, then let's try something else. Mm. Great. So I hope you can continue that discussion. Janet? I, I think that it, what emerged just now is that your problem statement is very wide. Um, so just a practical suggestion, one of the things that helps me sometimes in framing problem statements in all sorts of environments is to, is to look at what, do I, what would I like to see if I solved this problem. So not necessarily beginning with how would I solve the problem, we don't want to do that. But what would I see if that, that this was actually resolved? Mm. Um, and, and your problem is quite complex, so that may, may be interesting. <laughs> the second piece is actually very similar, I'm just going to frame it slightly differently from what Heather said, is that the notion of monitoring and evaluation as a control tool <coughs> is for me fundamentally problematic. Flawed. Because if we go back to, to Ben's earlier conversation around passive versus aggressive, and we stick another word in the middle there which is assertive, and we equate that to a parent, adult, child kind of framework, which is called transactional analysis, we, we, we will perpetuate a child state if we keep acting like parents. Mm. How do we yes. get people to show up as adults yeah. would be my question. And it's very similar to what they say, mm. just a little thing. Sure. So just to conclude, so by monitoring and evaluating more, you won't necessarily improve anything. In, In simple terms. <laughs> <laughs> so, so can I say, making a law instantly based on 
makes the law break her. But All right. Like as throw in the yes. divisive theory of change. Mm -hmm. So monitoring and evaluation, mm -hmm. exactly what you were saying, what do you want to see as a different result mm -hmm. in a monitoring and evaluation framework, which exists. Mm -hmm. And if you understand that and go through that process, which is not a tin box approach mm -hmm. or a technicist approach, there's mindfulness mm -hmm. in there, there's reflection, there's heuristic thought, all of that. And uh, so, so I come back to that. I would encourage, however, a cleaning up of that problem mm -hmm. yeah. statement, which has left us a little bit confused, and so that we may my So for time limit, I'm just going to ask the four questioners just to make a comment. And the first one on research method, any feedback, team? <laughs> uh, thanks, Ben. It's difficult to talk about the research method when you don't really know what the research aim or uh, what the, the, the problem statement should be. I mean, whatever said, I, I really agree uh, in terms of, you know, you're looking for something extrinsic, but are you sure what the problem is? I mean, I'm thinking to myself, I mean, based on what Robert was saying, I wouldn't even go, you know, as deep as going to talk about God, but talking about worldview, because worldviews shape and influence us in what we do and what we do. But do you sense him? He, he can stay in the qualitative yes. mode or yes. the quantitative yes. mode or mix? Yeah, I'm convinced he is fine in the qualitative <laughs> mode. Venzel, to get the depth. Any comments from your side on that question? I want to consider a topic and get a and Dr. Moda really sort of answer this topic part, which is my idea to start off with. And I found it difficult from from your topic find a point where your PhD starts. It says, I had a lot about the history, but your PhD is not going to change the history. Only the only our country's laws help you to space our jails to change history. Forward is your PhD. And that should be something when we sit and say, this is going to, this is different. This will have an impact. I battled from, from the statement from what I heard then, what will be the impact? Because me at the moment your impact is largely framed around legislation again. Because your your impact can be anything. Unless it's, unless it's legislative and they can implement it and someone believes that and puts it almost into law, it will have no effect. And that, that means your PhD will have no effect, which means no new research has been done. Okay. And I think in terms of the discussion we had, I think it's okay that he says that. Yeah, of course. Because you will get the... And clarity of output, which yes. is what you want from How to restructure... Yeah. Yes. There was... Yeah. <laughs> I think a, a lot of the stuff that sort of, had sort of like negated a lot of my, my thoughts in terms of um, how, what kind of questions you want to frame, but I think what was what came out was that who you're actually asking the yes. questions and what kind of questions you're actually asking them. And that literally, whatever questions I had, mm. literally just took them away. Okay. Because it, it, it became about, for me, it, someone spoke about culture. Uh, well, Rocco referred to something that, for me, I understood it as almost like, what is the culture of the organization? And it's almost like, um, I would ask a question around the culture that's been created by the leaders within those organizations and, and how to get to a, any kind of framework on, on what they, they can use to measure the, the kind of uh, work that Okay. And I think it is important what came out of that, both comments here and Dr. Lloyd's, is around if you interview the right people and you build the trust relationships with them, the questions won't necessarily matter as much as the relationship you have that you can go deep, you can ask questions that maybe are a little bit more risky if you've built a relationship and you're asking the right people who can answer the questions, perhaps. Okay. Am I going to add to that? that no, one? you can't. Because we've got ahead. time. Mario, <laughs> last comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was going to say, um, yes. you need to remind me again. So remind me again, it's models here, and that's in an internal thing. The business for the external thing is so I think you need to influence skills in both those spheres. So maybe like business ethics, there needs to be clear understanding of what business ethics are. And the other thing is I think, I mean, I come from the building industry. So I think um, if you look at project management of a building, for instance, and how you have um, a timeline that you have to meet, you have budgets you have to meet, and there's certain targets you have to meet, and there's somebody who's overseeing it. And I don't think production happens when there is the gap. That somebody can steal without anybody else realizing. And I think those gaps need to be closed. And I think that's what George's study is looking at. How do we close those gaps? Maybe in a, maybe looking at a project management 
uh, set of skills. Uh, to stop one individual, a group of individuals taking money that needs to go somewhere else. Okay, and there you have it. Uh, a lot of comments. I think you've got a lot of people that you can uh, go back to. And please do so and make yourselves available because that's all part of this, that you make new connections to join on your journey, to assist you and walk the path with you. Yes, certainly. Any last comment from your side? Well, Prof, I want to say thank you very much for the colleagues who have made this input. Obviously, um, this is going to change a lot. I think there is going to be 100% change. <laughs> if, if 99. Uh, the problem statement, really, the way it is now is not talking to exactly like the questions that I was asking. I suspected, but I didn't know. I didn't have the facts. He mentioned something very critical, which I'm considering. Um, this comparative study that I need mm. to do, because I was not sure if I can confine this study to the sitter. But I know uh, there is m that has been practiced. And uh, the objective, what is it that I'm trying to achieve out of this? Mm -hmm. And she mentioned extremely complicated <laughs> that I'm, I'm, I'm considering. And, <laughs> okay. and yes, uh, but uh, thanks very much for all the input, really. Yeah, and please it's join him on his journey. My, my uh, uh, and yeah. I hope we see you all working with him as many as you can, because that's the whole idea, that we will all cooperatively work with each other. And, and I think I'd like to say that your questions that you posed were really, when I saw the questions, because, you know, we asked you before, yeah. it was wonderful the type of thought that you actually put yourself out there. It's not easy to do. Mm. But like um, Prof Ben said, it is good for us to be able to interrogate. You asked really smart questions and questions that could really stimulate debate. So you are a curious mind, definitely, and without doubt. So you. exactly. So your cat wasn't killed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well done.